This lecture is brought to you by the virtual campus of the Reformed Baptist Seminary. For information on other courses or seminary programs, please contact us at info at rbseminary.org or go to our website, rbseminary.org. Sorry about that. Actually, hold on a minute, Vadim. Hold on a wee minute, brother. It's coming off. Sorry, folks. Okay. <clears throat> We're now in chapter 9 of the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, and the topic here is free will. If you want to read Jonathan Edwards at his very best, and by that I'm speaking about his intellectual best, pick up a copy of Freedom of the Will and put your thinking cap on. He begins the treatise by writing this, it may possibly be thought that there is no great need of going about to define or describe the will. This word being generally as well understood as any other words that we can use to explain it. And so perhaps it would be, had not philosophers, metaphysicians, and polemic divines brought the matter into obscurity by the things that they've said of it. But since it is so, I think it may be of some use and will tend to greater clearness in the following discourse to say a few words concerning it. And he goes on to then say, I observe that the will without any metaphysical refining is that by which the mind chooses anything. The faculty of the will is that power or principle of mind by which it is capable of choosing, an act of the will is the same as an act of choosing or choice. So we're speaking about man's will. The will is that element by which we choose what to believe, what to do. The question then is, is the will a separate or a standalone element of human nature? Or is it attached to some other or several other aspects of our being, such as the rational being or perhaps the affections? What is the interconnection with the rest of the inner man? Well, John Locke, the British philosopher who actually died one year after Jonathan Edwards, Edwards was born, he engaged in this discussion and he distinguished between the will and the desire. He said that one's will can run counter to one's desire. What you're longing for can even be contrary to what you're choosing. But Edwards responded to that saying, I cannot think that they are so entirely distinct that they can ever be properly said to run counter. A man never in any instance wills anything contrary to his desires or desires anything contrary to his will. And every act of the will, there is in it an act of choice that in every volition, there is a preference or a prevailing inclination of the soul. Jonathan Edwards was locked in step with many of the reformers who went before him. The broad agreement being that while we may speak of both the will and the affections, they are tied together. The will chooses due to the inclination of the heart. And if a man is able to choose what he desires and to desire what he chooses, he's free. Hence the freedom of the will. Man 
desires what he chooses and chooses what he desires. Therefore, he is free. What do we mean by freedom? Let's consider this freedom. What is it? We hear of it in paragraph one in the confession. God has endued the will of man with that natural liberty and power of acting upon choice, that it, that it is neither forced nor by any necessary necessity of nature determined to do good or evil. So we're reading here that God has endued man with a will that has natural liberty and power to act upon the choices that his will makes. To be endued is to be provided with a quality. It's to be given an inherent ability. So the will is said to have a natural liberty and power. Liberty obviously indicates freedom, and power refers to ability. Every man has a liberty and a freedom, and a power and ability. Then we find that the statement is that man makes volitional choices and behaves according to those choices. He makes a decision that is according to his preference, what he desires, and he is able to act upon that. So much so that we can say that all of man's actions are a display of what his will has decided. What we see, what we hear, is what ultimately he has chosen. And yet, as we'll see as we go through this chapter, he never freely chooses anything out with the parameters of the divine decree. While he freely decides and acts upon his own actions, or upon his own decisions, I should say, he does not have the ability to scrunch up God's will he does not have the ability to obliterate God's plan, God's purpose, and throw it away, replacing that with his own purpose. And yet, while he performs what God has decreed, he does so because it suits him, it's his preference, it's his desire, and because it's his desire, he chooses that thing. The issue of the freedom of the will is fraught with landmines, there are many difficulties, so much so that Augustine said, when grace is defended, we're thought to destroy free will. And when free will is acknowledged, we're thought to deny free grace. In other words, Augustine says, you can't win when you're speaking about free will. There will be somebody who's pointing the finger and accusing you either of destroying free will or destroying free grace. So, with the precariousness of the matter in mind, we're nevertheless going to launch in and seek to understand this wonderful but difficult topic. The first thing that the confession really does here is deal with the issue of freedom. What is this freedom? It's the freedom for man in whatever state he's in to act within the parameters of who he is. Of course, this freedom is limited by ability, and ability is determined by nature. A man may desire, for example, to fly like the birds or to jump through the treetops with the monkeys but he can't do it because of a lack of ability. Hence, those desires are more in the realm of fantasy. They're really nothing to do with free will. They're to do with just a mind that has the ability to imagine things that are impossible. <coughs> They're not relevant to real life in the area of the exercise of the, the, the will. A true effort to understand the freedom of the will must always acknowledge that its freedom is bound by the ability of the body or the ability of the mind 
the, the nature of the being. So when we speak of the freedom of the will, we're referring to that capacity to decide something and then accomplish that as the possessor, in our case, of human nature, with the abilities and the inabilities that this nature and the body that we possess bring to us. So really the only one who has liberty and power to decide anything, no matter how magnificent or amazing that might be, is of course God himself. But freedom to choose and to do what one's nature allows is what we mean when we speak of the liberty, the freedom of man's will. The confession asserts that this will of man with that natural liberty and power of acting upon choice, it is neither forced nor by any necessity of nature determined to do good or evil. The great English Baptist Benjamin Cox's son, Nehemiah, he said, this liberty consists in a rational spontaneity. He acts freely. That is under no coaction, but does what the last and practical judgment of his own understanding dictates to him. Man does that which his mind, his reason, his desire leads him to. And we're told that he is not forced, nor by any necessity of nature, determined to do good or evil. That is, the will is that there is not one thing in nature that requires or forces it to make a specific choice. There is nothing in the will's own composition, and not even anything in nature around that requires man to make a choice, and he's got, he's got no other option. He must act in this way because something in uh, the, 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 the character of his being or something in uh, the nature around him demands it. Now, for example, today we know a lot about DNA. We know how incredible an influence it is upon us. Now, Jonathan Edwards and our confessional fathers likely had no idea of the things that we now know about DNA. We know how alike it makes one generation to another. It can be uncanny just uh, when you look at someone and you see their child and you think that's exactly how you must have looked 25 years ago. This child is your double, although a younger version. And we know that it goes more than that. It goes deeper than that. DNA can also, even in a family, cause there to be certain uh, common dispositions that individuals have, even personalities. And even as I move my hands the way I'm doing just now, I actually see my dad uh, doing this. This is, this is not me. This is my father. Uh, all of these hand movements are exactly how I used to watch my dad. And I'm not trying to impersonate him, but it's just happening, and it's happening more the older I get. There's something about our DNA. And, and it can even include preferences, things that you desire that your children, it turns out, they desire, they like, uh, biases, if you like. Yet even with all of this that we know about DNA, it can never make someone choose one way as opposed to another. It certainly can be one of the thousands of factors that contributes to the free choice that the will is making, but it doesn't force it. You can't say, you can't blame your DNA. You can acknowledge that it's one of the factors that you take into consideration as you make your decisions. Nothing other than the free choice rooted in one's desire can be attributed to one's decision. The will may consider every factor at its disposal, such as the weather and how I feel when it's hot or how I feel when it's cold. It could be the last time I had food. Oh, it's two minutes ago and I ate too much. 
or it's 10 hours ago and I didn't eat enough. It could be what's in my bank account. Well, there's so much in it. It, it gives me options and it gives me, it inflames desires or there's nothing in it and it causes frustration and it causes anger and jealousy. It could be even something like, well, who's the president and how does he make me feel? What, uh, what, what do I think about my feet hurting? Are my neighbors nice or are they rude? Many other factors. But ultimately, having considered what the individual believes is necessary and helpful and preferable, the will then freely chooses based upon those preferences. Not one of those things or all of those factors demand and require the will to choose a certain thing, but the will decides upon what it prefers. So the confession is not saying here nothing influences the will, it is saying nothing requires the will to choose one way as opposed to another. John Owen wrote, we grant man in the substance of all his actions as much power, liberty, and freedom as a mere created nature is capable of. We grant him to be free in his choice of all outward compulsion or inward natural necessity. That's the things that we've been speaking about. Outward compulsion or inward natural necessity. We grant him to be free of these things, to work according to choice and deliberation, spontaneously embracing what seems good to him. Now, having defined the will, the next paragraph moves on into the realm of showing the first man's various experiences of what the will in his various states looks like. The first state that is spoken of is the state of innocence. And I've put this book up for you to take note of. Thomas Boston was mentioned several times earlier today with regard to his view uh, of the covenant. Uh, and it would seem that there's a lot that we can discover uh, regarding that. Uh, but this is, if you like, staple uh, when it comes to dealing with uh, human nature in its fourfold state, Thomas Boston, uh, a book that's highly recommended. But the first state of man is the state of innocence. Man in his state of inno innocency, paragraph two, had freedom and power to will and to do that which was good and well-pleasing to God, but yet was unstable so that he might fall from it. We see right away that the matter of man and his will has not been a uniform and singular experience. Indeed, the fourfold state, this is the first. In man's original creation, we see a will that is very different from that which is exercised and experienced in man's fallen state. And indeed, that is different from what we see in man's regenerated condition. And that is different from what we see in man, or we will see in man as a fully redeemed and eternally sanctified creature, who upon seeing him will indeed be like him. Our own Sam Waldron wrote, free will is not a kind of immutable faculty for making random decisions being tied to human nature. It exists in different states because human nature exists in different states. The fourfold state of the will is perhaps, perhaps best presented in that book that I've just represented. Not only does it explain human nature from creation to the final destination, forever with the Lord, it does so in a simple illustrative, and enjoyable way. Indeed, as we look at this topic, we see that the original state of man as a created being was that he was innocent, his state of innocency. Namely, he was upright and perfect. 
What an incredible description this is of our first parents. Adam's standing was upright insofar as there was no detrimental blotch on his character. His thinking was God-honoring, his words were God-glorifying, and his actions manifested holiness. The truth of Genesis 5 verses 1 and 2 cannot be undermined. We read, when God created man, he made him in his likeness. Male and female, he created them and blessed them and named them man when they were created. In the likeness of God, per <coughs> perfect in every element of being, lovely in every aspect of character, delightful in every quality of nature, his desires and thoughts and therefore his decisions, his will was always and only positive and healthy. Externally, humanity was very well set up for success in the garden, the garden of delight, paradise itself. And internally, humanity was in a very good place. Our first father and mother had been given a righteous law to keep them on track, and they were disposed and able to keep that law. They wanted to. It was their will to keep that law. How wonderful it was to be inclined to do good and to maintain a wonderful relationship with God, to have everything in their possession, everything that they needed by way of direction and ability to maintain that glorious position. There was no need of redemption. There was no need for anything to be fixed. God looked at man in this natural, created state and said, it is all very good. And that includes the will, the desires. Thomas Boston explains man's original condition under three headings. The first is man's understanding was a lamp of light. The third is his affections were orderly, pure, and holy. But it's the second one that we're focusing in on, and that is that man's will was in all things agreeable to God's will. Man's will perfectly matched God's will. His will was disposed by its original make, Boston says, to follow the will of God as the shadow follows the body. Has your shadow ever left you? Has your shadow ever deviated from the path that you've been going on? Never. The shadow follows the body, and so the will of man was following the will of God. And Adam knew clearly what God wanted of him, and his desire was in perfect conformity to that understanding. There was nothing about the will of God that the will of man objected to. Adam's will was directed and naturally inclined to God and God's goodness. The state of innocency was beautiful. God and man in harmony. The divine will was loved and embraced by the human will. And it was willingly embraced. Boston points out that there wasn't even an equal balance to good and evil. For at that rate, he had not been upright. In other words, the will was wholly disposed to God and to good. And yet, as the confession says, it was unstable so that he might fall from it. That perfect conformity of man's will to God's will, it looked great, it was great, but it wasn't guaranteed. Indeed, man was in need of perseverance in this state. If man was to fall from this condition, it would, however, have to be because he wanted to. It couldn't be by accident. It would have to be his will that chose to turn away from God and to turn to self. John Calvin wrote, 
in this integrity, man by free will had the power, if he so willed, to attain eternal life. He fell solely by his own will. And so that's a little bit that we see there in paragraph 2. As we move on to paragraph 3, we see man in his fallen state. Man in his innocency now moves into man as a fallen creature. Paragraph 3, man by his fall into a state of sin hath wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. So as a natural man being altogether adverse from that good and dead in sin is not able by his own strength to convert himself or to prepare himself thereunto. Just consider the words of Scripture. There are so many passages of Scripture that we could turn to. Here are just a few. I'm sure familiar to us. Romans 5 and verse 6, when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly without strength. That's where man went to. Romans 8 and verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Ephesians 2 and verse 1, he made you alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Titus 3 and 3, we ourselves, we were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy and being hateful. John 6 and 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And then, uh, I'll just read Ephesians 4, 17. The Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. What a description we have of man who had the external and internal blessing of that original state, and now he has fallen so much so he's strengthless. He's unable to be subject to the law of God. He's dead in trespasses and sins. He's deceived. He's foolish. He cannot come to God. He's steeped in futility. He's in darkness, and he's given over to lewdness. This, in essence, is what the doctrine of total depravity looks like when it comes to the matter of man's will. The will is part of all of this. The matter of the human will and its freedom is, of course, one of the great areas of, of, of debate, one of the, the, the great accusations that the naysayers of Reformed theology often go to is this issue of the will of man. It's here that they believe that they've got their strongest arguments against the doctrine of total depravity. The accusations, more often than not, are that we are those whose historical, uh, who, whose historical theologians' positions uh, make us like robots. Uh, we're said by them to just be robotic creatures, a creature without any volition, who merely obeys pre-programmed agendas and has no say in it, no choice in it. And you've all heard that kind of argument. Many of you used that argument not so long ago, perhaps. Now, of course, when we hear these accusations that we're saying that man is robotic, that man has no will, that man is just a pre-programmed instrument, when we hear those accusations, we don't recognize that they're possibly speaking about us. You almost want to look over your shoulder to see who they're accusing of these things, because they're just simply untrue. They're just false. There's they're nothing less than ridiculous caricatures. We're, we're not saying, nor have any of our fathers in the faith, uh, and never has the doctrine that we believe said that man does not have a will. Nobody said that. 
nor has anyone with a semblance of theological credibility ever said that if a man does have a will, that will is unable to act freely and according to the desires of the one with the will. In fact, we are saying that is actually how it works. Man in his fallen state still has a will, and he still acts freely according to the desires that he has. Sproul explains the Augustinian view of the will and a summary of what was taught in the late fourth century by Augustinian theologians and then progressing into Calvinistic scholars. And this is what R.C. Sproul would say. He says, I think I have it there. There are some of it anyway. He says, Augustine did not deny that fallen man still has a will. Come on, people. We've never said that man doesn't have a will. Augustine did not deny that fallen man still has a will and that the will is capable of making choices. He argued that fallen man still has a free will, but has lost his moral liberty. The state of original sin leaves us in the wretched condition of being unable to refrain from sinning. We still are able to choose what we desire, but our desires remain chained by our evil impulses. Sproul says, Augustine argued that the freedom that remains in the will always leads to sin. Thus, in the flesh, we are free only to sin, a hollow freedom indeed. It is freedom without liberty, a real moral bondage. True liberty can only come from without, from the work of God on the soul. Therefore, we are not only partly dependent upon grace for our conversion, but we are totally dependent upon grace. It should be noted that when we say that man has lost his moral liberty and that he cannot refrain from sinning, we don't mean that there's nothing good that a man can desire or choose to do as far as the, the common welfare of his family or of his fellows are concerned. When we speak of the will as fallen, when we speak of it in its depraved state, we don't mean that the will is as wicked as it can be. We're simply saying that along with every other faculty of man, it's infected by sin, and as such it's corrupted, and it's made incapable of choosing God. And the, the confession actually helps us really understand this when it says this, the will has lost all ability, you'll note, to any spiritual good. And then it adds accompanying salvation. C can a firefighter choose to put his life on the line to save a child from a burning building? Yes, he can, and that's a good choice. Does that choice in any way contribute to his salvation, to his eternal destiny? No. That same will which chooses good to act in that way in the burning building scenario will also naturally choose to take that good choice and make it a badge of self-righteousness. And sadly, what started as a relatively good choice, saving a child, will become a matter for which the fireman will be condemned before a holy God because of pride and self-righteousness that swells up within his heart. So he can make a good choice, relatively speaking, but with regards to his spiritual good and anything that would accompany his salvation, even his good choices turn out to be bad for his soul. Sadly, the human will, which was once fully in tune with the holiness of God and the law of God, is no longer in that place. Instead, that beautiful will is now in an ugly rebellion against God. Now, you may prefer to speak of radical corruption or pervasive iniquity rather than total depravity. Call it what you will. The fact is, man died spiritually that gloomy day in the garden. 
and so did all who would come from our father and mother Adam and Eve, everyone who has or ever will be born by what the confession calls ordinary generation. Our wills, therefore, can desire and choose relatively good things, relatively wise and helpful choices can be made, but they're no longer able to make godly decisions, but rather self-centered decisions. The will that once delighted in God's will is beyond impaired. It's altogether altered. Indeed, as we look out and see that with the diminishing of common grace around us in society and the restraints that come with common grace, we see that men and women are choosing even darker and darker ways. There's a choice to hate, a choice to pervert little children. Natural affections are twisted. What we ought to love is easily despised in our society, and what we ought to despise is naturally loved, and it's people's choice that that is so. We must ask the question, can we choose God? Our wills are in bondage to sin, and we cannot come to Christ in and of ourselves. John chapter 6 and verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. But why can we not come? Jesus answers that question in John 5 verse 40. You are not willing to come to me that you may have life. You are not willing. You can't come to me. Well, why can't we come? Because you really don't want to come. You're not able to come because you don't desire to come, and you don't desire to come because your nature is such that you ha have no ability to come. It, it, it all rolls into one. In 1 Corinthians 15, 22, we're told, in Adam all die. In Romans 5, 12, though one man, through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men. Death came upon all, dead in sin. That's the defilement of all the faculties of soul and body. And that became the new condition of the sons of Adam. And because of that, they don't want to choose God. It was Augustine who's accredited with, the, with first saying, uh, I thought it was here obviously not, uh, with first saying that in creation man was able not to sin, but also able to sin. That would be posse non peccari and also posse peccari. However, since the fall, man is now only able to sin. He, is, he has no longer got the capacity to not sin. He became not able to not sin, non posse, non peccari. Sin was now a reality. No man in this state would be able to live a life with choices that were only good and all for the glory of God. Why? Because the nature of the will changed. It was now infected by sin. And the choices that would be made from that point on would reflect the nature of the source of those choices. The nature of the will was now no longer innocent. It no longer naturally reflected the will of God. It was now sinful and selfish and guided by what pleased it in its new condition. Posse, non peccari, and also posse, peccari. However, since the fall, man is now only able to sin. He's now absolutely unable to not sin. He is truly non posse, non peccari. Free to act according to his nature, but the nature has changed. 
A. A. Hodge comments, by liberty, we mean inalienable prerogative of the human soul of exercising volition as it pleases. And this sense, in this sense, man is as free now as before the fall. So, it's not that there's uh, an inability to act according to nature now while once man had it, it's still the same. It's just before the fall, man could and did choose according to the preference of his will, which was honoring God. And in this day, he chooses according to the preference of his will, which is honoring himself and pleasing himself. Jonathan Edwards explains in a very intricate way that the will, while still completely free, will always choose in keeping with its own inclinations. He argues that at the heart of freedom is the ability to choose what one wants rather than what someone else is expecting. And man chooses what he wants. The difference is the nature has changed, not the issue of freedom. In the original state, the will wanted God, now it wants self. Martin Luther, in his book, The Bondage of the Will, illustrates this, I think, wonderfully by depicting a waterfall. And he speaks of how the water flows gratuitously and powerfully over the edge of the waterfall. And no one looks at that waterfall with the idea that it's anything but free. It's free. Look at the water cascading over, freely pouring over the edge. Look at the spray as it bounces off the rocks. Freedom. And yet, Luther says, there is an underlying principle, however, that determines the direction of that water. The water is free, but it's free to always and only flow down. It cannot act against nature. It cannot suddenly begin to flow up. There is a principle we know obviously now as gravity that determines the direction of the water. And in a similar way, Luther is saying this is man's will. It is free. Look at it acting so freely as it cascades over the precipice. And it's always going in the direction that nature requires, namely the fallen nature. Many of the choices that man makes can look like good choices, as we've indicated to the human eye, but the reality is they are tainted by selfish reasons. They are not ultimately for the glory of God, and as a result, even those good-looking choices are riddled with guilt and are worthy of divine condemnation. And I think Isaiah 64 verses 6 and 7 really drill this home to our consciences when we read this. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Our righteousnesses, our very best is not good at all. Our best choices, our greatest desires are, are seen by God to have dirt permeating right through every fiber. And so, as we read in paragraph 3, the latter part, so as a natural man, being altogether adverse from that good and dead in sin, is not able by his own strength to convert himself or to prepare himself thereunto. How can he? In his natural state, everything is going the wrong way. And he, it's going the wrong way by his choice, freely. This must be taken into account when thinking about the natural man then choosing God. He simply won't because he can't. His will is dead when it comes to spiritual matters. He may choose wise things every day. He may choose to put on a raincoat when it's raining instead of a mere t-shirt. He may choose to invest his money rather than spend it as soon as he touches it. He may choose good things such as buying his children food instead of a sports car that he longs for. He may choose to give his neighbor whose car won't jump, it won't start a jump start when he's already running late for work. He can choose many decent things, good things, wise things, 
but he cannot rouse himself to choose God. A. A. Hodge, quoting an old Lutheran document, uh, tells us that this is what it says. I actually tried to find what this document properly is. I thought it was from the 39 Articles, and I don't think it is. And Google didn't really help me, to be perfectly honest. But this is from an old Lutheran document, uh, which will remain mysterious, <laughs> at least from my perspective. But it's marvelous. Listen. Therefore, we believe that as it is impossible for a dead body to revive itself or to communicate animal life to itself, in the same degree it's impossible for man spiritually dead by reason of sin to recall spiritual life within himself. And then it gets even clearer as it goes on to say this. We believe that neither the intellect, heart, nor will of the unregenerate man is able in its own natural strength either to understand, believe, embrace, will, begin, perfect, perform, operate, or cooperate anything to things divine and spiritual. But man is so far dead and corrupt in respect to good that in the nature of man since the fall and before regeneration, there is not even a scintilla of spiritual strength remaining whereby he can prepare himself for the grace of God or apprehend that grace when offered or is able in the whole or in the half or at least in part to apply or accommodate himself to that grace or to confer or to act or to operate or to cooperate anything for his own conversion. That just about says it all. Man is dead, and yet his will is still free. He's in utter bondage, and yet he can make choices, but always according to his own fallen nature. Augustine portrays the dilemma very clearly in this way. It was by the evil use of his free will that man destroyed both it and himself. What a thought. It's like suicide. Suicide of the will. He goes on and he says, As a man who kills himself must, of course, be alive when he kills himself. But after he's killed himself, he ceases to live. And he cannot restore himself to life. So when a man by his own free will sinned, then sin being victorious over him, the freedom of his will was lost. What kind of liberty, I ask, can a bond slave possess except when it pleases him to sin? For he is freely in bondage who does with pleasure the will of his master. Accordingly, he who is the servant of sin is free to sin. Free to sin but not free to not sin. Free to do relatively good works, but not free to do anything that honors God or that will in any way uh, achieve salvation. Without the Spirit, man's will is not free since it's been laid under by shackling and conquering desires. Augustine. Romans 3 11 and 12, there is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They've all turned aside. They've all together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Isn't it sad? There's not one man anywhere who has even one moment of an experience like Adam and Eve had in the garden. Nowhere in the world So, we've looked at man in his innocency. We've seen man in his fallen state. And then, in paragraph 4, we move on to see man in his regenerated state. Hear what the confession says. When God converts a sinner and translates him into that state of grace, he freeth him from his natural bondage under sin, and by his grace alone, enables him freely to will and to do that which is spiritually good. Yet so as by reason 
of his remaining corruptions, he doth not perfect, perfectly, nor only will that which is good, but doth also will that which is evil. Freed from bondage and enabled to do that which is spiritually good. Beaky and Smalley write, free will is no longer an empty shadow, but a living, vibrant reality. Consequently, the regenerate have a new willingness that is worked in them by God, for it is God which works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Try to follow this. In innocence, man was not able, was able to not sin, but also able to sin. In the, in the fallen state, he's not able to not sin. In the regenerate state, he regains the state of posse non peccari. He, he can now not sin. He's now able to refuse sin. But sadly, ah, he also can sin. And sadly, he does sin, even a regenerate man. As Paul speaks of in Romans 7 verse 15, through 24, in part which says, the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not do, that I practice. Paul is a man who wanted to do good, but realized evil is present with me. Two laws. One, knowing that there is a desire to obey God, and the other, crying out that the flesh be obeyed. Indeed, Boston says, regenerating grace is powerful and efficacious and gives the will a, a, a new turn. It does not indeed force it, but sweetly yet powerfully draws it so that his people are willing in the day of his power. We can honor God. We can, but we don't always do that. Our time has really gone, so I'll move on very quickly to the glorified state. As we go by, uh, <clears throat> some of our notes, and we'll, we'll move on to this fourth state, the glorified state. The will of man, paragraph five of our confession, is made perfectly and immutably free to good alone in the state of glory alone. For the first time, man will enjoy the condition of simply being unable to sin, non posse peccari, unable to sin. It's a state that is way better than the first original state where we were able not to sin. Now we'll be unable to sin. How wonderful to be eternally in that condition where the will can only always want to obey and honor God. This is a state of having no desire to think or say or do or believe anything contrary to what God in His holiness and God in His truth requires. We will be like Him. The nature infected by Adam's fall forever gone, and the desires now Christ-like only and always and forever. Just in closing, Borgman and Chang wrote, humanity will be free agents who are good, perfect and holy. Humanity as God intended for it to be. In the great scope of redemptive history, Adam was holy and unstable. Glorified men are holy and stable. We will want good and we will be good and all our actions will flow out of that perfected nature. Something to look forward to. Victory indeed. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, we thank you for all that we've heard over these past couple of days. We thank you for each of the students who have listened intently, and we ask that what we've heard and what we've understood would go beyond even uh, our mere intellect that matters such as our will and our affections would be uh, indeed touched and changed and sanctified, even as we have considered these things. And Lord, we ask that you would take each and everyone back to their homes in safety. We pray for those who have flown and those 
who've come a distance by car, we pray that you'd preserve them and protect them. And we ask that tomorrow, even here on the Lord's Day, we would truly know the joy of meeting with you, the King of kings, the one who has created us, and the one who is even now, by grace, sustaining us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.